everybody. Um, thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. Um, my whole plan, or goal this afternoon is to make this as useful a session um, as we possibly can so that you can take away to your own context um, some really good tips that you can use to level up your own plots um, and just make sure that the data is and that the stories that you try and tell from your data really get across to the audiences that you're wanting to share them with. So without further ado, uh, I am going to share my screen. Um, and, oh, something's, yeah, that's all right. So let's share the screen and we can get started with the presentation. Um, hopefully you can see my title slide there that says level up your plots. If I can get a thumbs up from somebody, that'd be great. Great, thank you, Josie, that's helpful. Um, Okay, so as I said, we're here to talk about leveling up um, our plots and to make it as useful a session as we can. Uh, by way of introduction, I'm Cara Thompson. Um, the way that I got into all this data viz stuff is that I have a PhD in psychology during which I took up a lot of analysis stuff. Um, I went from there into the world of postgraduate medical examinations where I spent about a decade analyzing um, the results from exams and providing advice on exam structure. Um, on the basis of what we were finding. And during that time, I taught myself to use R principally to automate a lot of the reporting that we were doing, because the exams, as you can imagine, run several times a year, different specialties, some similarities, some things that are quite different. Um, but what we wanted to do was automate a lot of the number crunching so that we could then spend more time on the stuff that needed some expertise. Um, from there, I've gone into um, freelance data consulting, specializing in databases and in creating what I call enhanced reproducible outputs. So getting you from your data to a really nicely formatted document with nice visualizations um, in, the, in the mix as well. And I'd say the thing that drives me um, throughout this is to help others maximize the impact of their expertise. Um, I just really like the thought of taking the frustrations out of the copy pasting from one of software to another to excel not doing what you want it to so oh what colors should i pick all that kind of stuff it doesn't really need your expertise so that you can then be more free and um, to use your time for the stuff that does but also maximize the impact in terms of helping the viewers um, and the ultimate end users really understand the stories um, in the data that you've got so that's a wee bit about me um, and about this afternoon's goal so the the goal is to equip you with design tips and coding tricks to enhance the storytelling capabilities of your plots. Uh, we're going to do a mix of me talking, of doing a bit of live coding, which is not something I've done very much of uh, up till now, but I've always really enjoyed um, the stuff that you, the kind of serendipity of learning stuff that you didn't know you didn't know um, by seeing how somebody else approaches coding. So we're going to do some of that as well, and we're going to do some exercises. Um, we're going to break the session up into three parts. Um, in the first part, we're going to look at using colour and orientations to make our stories easy to remember. Um, in the second part, we're going to look at adding colour and hierarchy to our text um, to keep the main thing the main thing. And in our third part, we're going to look at annotating our plots to highlight key information and help the readers engage a little bit more with the patterns that we've got there. And if we've got time at the end, we'll go for a quick bonus track, um, talking about some sources of inspiration and giving you a chance to do some question and answers, maybe some feedback about your own plots. And at the end of each part, we'll take a 15 minute break um, during which you can go and apply the things to the plots that you're working on, um, or go and get the coffee or a mixture of the two, um, just so that you get a bit of a breather, but you also um, get a chance to try it out and see if you get stuck and we can chat about the stuff that, the stuff that you're stuck on. Um, as I said, we're going to try and make this as useful as possible and that probably means being a bit vulnerable. You know, if you're stuck on something that you don't quite get, just give us a shout and um, we'll hop in and have a look. So I thought because there's not um, too many of us to make this unmanageable, I thought it might be nice to do a quick round of introductions if people were happy doing that. Um, so you've already heard that I'm Cara, I work in data consulting, I mostly use R for data viz and um, for creating reproducible outputs. Um, I'm going to ask you about your favourite type of plots, I feel I should answer that for myself. Um, my favourite type of plot is the bee swarm plot. Um, I really like the way that you can present all the dots, but also show their distribution quite nicely and you can colour the dots by group and just show some really exciting patterns that way. Um, and the thing I find most challenging when creating plots is actually picking the right colours 
Um, so we will talk about how I go about doing that because it is something that I find difficult, but it's something that I think I've learned to do. Um, so hopefully you can learn from that um, as well. So if we're happy to go around um, and introduce ourselves, I think that will help me um, get a good feel for the main challenges and um, make sure that we address things that people are most concerned about. So Josie, would you mind going first? No, absolutely. So I'm Josie. I work in um, NHS Gloucestershire. So I'm part of the ICB uh, down here. Um, I mostly use R for well, all sorts of things, really. We do a lot with um, theoplots, so plotting patient um, contacts across all of our different services. So we use it to use to, uh, with our linked data, um, but I also run yeah. some machine learning type stuff, um, which is always fun. And my favorite Great. type, of, I like, um, as far as plots go, I quite like small multiples. So you can show how data, the shape of data is changing over time. Yeah. That's quite an interesting thing to do with plots. Yeah. Um, nice. And some of the things I find most challenging is just sometimes just getting the data into the right shape in the first place. Okay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so a bit of data wrangling. That, that We're going to do a wee bit of that as part of this uh, part of this talk. So hopefully there'll be some tips that you can pick up there. Awesome. Great. Who's going next? I think, Kath, you've got your microphone unmuted, so let's, I'm going to pick on you. No, maybe not. Anyone else wants to volunteer to go next? Kath's popped hers in the chat. Ah, brilliant. Would you mind picking that? I've uh, lost track of all the different windows that I'm supposed to be looking at. <laughs> um, Kath, sorry, she's actually got a microphone. Um, but she's a research paramedic working for an NHS ambulance service, uh, just starting out with R, and they mainly use R for queries, data queries and modelling. Okay, brilliant. Thanks, Kath. Um, Thank you. I'll go next. Uh, <laughs> hi, I'm Neha, and uh, I work for Audit and Gem CSU. Uh, so I have been using R from my uni when I did my business analytics master's degree. Mm. Uh, Mostly R was used for machine learning modeling. I, and in my current work, and normally I struggle with plotting <laughs> just because I have used a lot of Excel and Tableau for uh, you know more of visualization. So when mm -hmm. I try to do some, so, but yeah, it's just like moving along. So I wanna, pick up more from here and I think that's one of the learning which I am trying to get into you know to just use R for plotting as well and how mm. we use uh, the visualization side of R just so that when you do the analysis you don't have to jump here and there <laughs> yeah okay that's great it. thank you he wants to go next I don't mind going next. Great, thank you. <laughs> so, hi, I'm Becca, Senior Public Health Intelligence Analyst for Derby City Council. Um, I'm really new to R, so we've only been using it in the last 12 months. So previously mm -hmm. used loads of Excel. We were the Excel people. Um, but yeah, loving it so far. Just looking to learn a little bit more around plotting. So our plots are a little bit basic. Um, but mm -hmm. yeah, the thing I find most challenging is to knowing what the code I need to write to get it to do what I want it to do. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So you'll have seen, if you've had a chance to have a look around our workspace, um, and you've got the full code in there. So you can take it and copy paste as much as it as, as you, much of it as you like. Um, there is no copyright on this kind of stuff at all. So um, hopefully there'll be some useful stuff there that you can just Perfect. Thank grab you. and put in your own projects. Perfect. Who have we not heard from? Um, I, I, can, I can go Sam. now. Hi. Hi. Uh, can you hear me OK? Yeah, yeah. Um, yes, yeah, so I'm, I'm Sam, I'm a Senior Population Health uh, Management Intelligence Analyst. Um, I'm fairly new to R, so I've only just been learning the past few months, um, which I've just started to accelerate really by kind of anything I've already done like in Excel, I'm now trying to just do an R as, as a way to kind of learn. Um, my yeah. favourite type of plot so far, I think, is the, um, it's actually a package, it's called the Facets Geo package so it's like the facet wrap that allows you to do lots of small, small multiples but you can, okay you, you do it so it's arranged in like a map sequence like a cartogram 
So if you, oh, think, yeah, you yeah. Have, so mm -hmm. if you think you have your kind of, I don't know, your London local authorities will have them all represented as squares in the kind of arranged a bit like a map, and you yeah. just place your plots, whether it's a line chart or a bar chart within mm -hmm. those squares. Yeah. Uh, so I'm, I'm quite a big fan of those. Um, yeah, those look great. I haven't actually built any of those, but I've always seen other people do them and thought, yeah, that looks amazing. <laughs> so good on you. Um, yeah, but the most, the thing I find most challenging, I think, for plots, and um, again, it's because it's, it's different doing it in R, I mean, I think it's less point and click, but mm -hmm. just for a little kind of fine tuning of like, uh, I don't know, amending your, your legend or, or just putting labels in different places or trying to do an annotation. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm finding it seems to. I'm probably doing it wrong, but I find it's quite a convoluted process to just do yeah. what I would otherwise say is kind of small tweaks, and especially somebody who's kind of uses a lot of kind of desktop GIS software, I can just kind of get that annotate at will just using my, my kind of mouse, really. Yeah, yeah. No, definitely. So I will be sharing some tips on how to streamline some of that annotation. Um, so hopefully that will that will help you as well. Thank you. Um, Thank you. Yeah, I can I can go next. Uh, Great, thank I'm, you. I'm, I'm Felix, uh, Felix Mukoro. Uh, I work with, with the digital analytics and research team in NHS England. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm very new to to R. Uh, again, I've been using more Excel than and just started looking at R uh, in the last month. Okay. That's also really, really new. Uh, yeah, I don't, I don't really have any favorite plots, so um, it's more I just plot uh, mainly in Excel based on what mm -hmm. what is required. Uh, yeah, uh, again, challenging because I'm I'm new to R, remembering the codes and the sequence of all the syntax. Uh, yeah. Sometimes it is it's very challenging. Yeah, no, definitely. Well, welcome to the tribe, uh, and hopefully this will be a useful introduction to stuff for you. Um, I'll go next, yeah. Jacqueline. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, Jacqueline, that'd be great. Thank you. Hi, yeah. So I'm Jacqueline uh, and I work for um, the strategy unit, which is part of the NHS. Um, um, I've only been working for them since April. Um, I started okay. using, so I started using R a little bit in my previous job, um, sort of about um, three years ago, but wasn't didn't really have much opportunity to use it. Um, and so I, I felt it, it was very stop start and you know three steps forward and two steps back and and but since April since I changed job um it's been a bit of a baptism by fire so <laughs> <laughs> I'm getting on with it a lot better now. Um, okay, I'm, mostly, it's, it's... I'm, I'm mostly using it for to analyze data, various different data sets. Um, yeah. Previously, I, I was a big SQL user, so. Um, kind of adjusting my thinking a bit um and then i'm not sure i've got a favorite type of plot i may be quite like a box plot i have to say i'm pretty boring um <laughs> and uh but I, I actually I, I don't mind if i win plot as well yeah um, and then it's more exciting uh, than a box plot but similar vibe yeah, so that yeah, sounds yeah, good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah 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 um and um i think probably the thing i find most challenging when creating a plot is um I can do a basic plot like now quite easily, but it's when yeah. I look at it and think I don't like that, I want to change this or that or the other. And it's like I know what I want to do in my head, but I don't know how to do it in R. And that's the bit yeah. I find challenging. But the more I do, the the easier I'm finding that. I do think mm -hmm. like learning a foreign language, you've just got to immerse yourself in it and force yourself. Uh, yeah along don't you and then it, then you do start to pick stuff up and and suddenly you realize you've actually written some straight out of your head without looking something up and it's like a yeah. moment yeah, <laughs> yeah. that is so, always a great moment i agree yeah, so, so I, my i mean the re my reason for doing this wanting to do this is that um I, what i struggle with a bit is figuring out what's the best way to sort of visualize um some data and, and and just like idea ideas for nice sort of nice plots really I, okay I can be a little bit boring uh, 
That's right. We, like we all have our plot types that we fall back to. I fall back to a scatter plot a lot of the time mm-hmm. when I'm trying to visualize stuff. So uh, that's what we're going to be exploring today. But um, I will share at the end some sources of um, crazy plots that you can look at that will yeah, definitely you. broaden the horizon. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Great. And we heard from everybody. I think so. I think so. There's a couple that keep um, jumping in that. I don't think they're having technical okay. issues, but I think that's everyone that's on the call at the moment we've heard. Okay. From. Brilliant. Well, I suggest we crack on. Um, and um, yeah, just you keep me right if anything pops up in the chat that I'm, that I've not been aware of. <laughs> that would be really helpful. <laughs> uh, so that was really helpful for me um, just to get a handle on who everybody is, what you're using R for, and what you struggle, what you struggle with. And I think it sounds to me like there will be something in here for everybody. Um, so uh, that's quite exciting. Um, if we come to the end and we've not answered your burning question, do do let us know and uh, and we'll we'll get to that as well. Um, but before we get started on any of these uh, tips and tricks, I'm going to ask you to take a moment and um, suspend all disbelief and follow me in an adventure um, about what the Palmer penguins got up to um, last weekend. So last weekend, the Palmer penguins decided that they would do something a bit different um, and that they would run a baking competition um, and that they would pit the species against each other uh, to decide um, which penguin species could bake the best banana bread. And they were all given different types of bananas. Uh, some of them were given ripe bananas, um, overripe bananas or underripe bananas. Um, and they were also allowed to um, have a look at uh, different durations for baking. Um, and the bakes were just judged based on yumminess. And so that's the, the factor that they were looking at. Um, it's totally bonkers, but uh, this first episode of The Great Penguin Bake Off will set us up well with a story um, that we can tell uh, from our plots. So here we go. Here's our first plot. Um, and what we have is a bar chart, fairly standard bar chart. And the penguins had a baking competition. They were all given different types of banana. Um, this is just your default ggplot uh, bar chart with a nicer theme background. But if I do this, um, it makes it pretty obvious which species were given which type of banana without having to add legend. So I'm not saying don't add legend, I'm just illustrating that sometimes you can do a bit of storytelling just with the colors that you've got. And the Adeli penguins took it to an extra level and they decided that they were gonna experiment with different quantities of banana in their mix. And again, if I do this, you can already guess um, which um, yeah, which islands chose which quantities of banana to include in the mix. Um, and finally, I mentioned that they looked at uh, different durations uh, for baking time. And if I asked you which species left the cake in the oven for the longest, I can't see your faces, but I'm assuming that some of you are maybe just starting to <laughs> tilt your head a little bit to the side. And um, if you find yourself ever doing that, it's probably a sign that um, you should be considering swapping your plot round in its direction. We tend to think of duration as something that runs along the X axis. And so again, a little bit of orientation this time instead of color and um, helps us tell our story nicely. So there we go. We have plotted our first episode of Great Penguin Bake Off. Um, and yes, it's totally ridiculous, but it illustrates the first two points um, that I want to share with you um, of these seven tips that we're going to look at together today. The first one is to use colour and transparency purposefully and um, to leverage some of that in um, sharing um, in sharing the story. And the other one is to use intuitive orientations, um, if you can. Is everybody still with me? Can I get a thumbs up? Great. So, perfect. Thank you very much. Um, the next tips that we're going to look at are adding colour to the text to help orient our readers, and um, use colours and fonts to add some text hierarchy. And um, we're going to try and reduce unnecessary eye movements, and that's to do with annotations, um, highlight important data points, and give everything a bit of space to read. So there's quite a lot of stuff that we're going to cover. Um, but um, as I said, the goal is to make this useful. So take away from it what you think you need and what you think you can apply um, to your own context. So part one, we're going to look at colour and orientation. Um, and if I have totally lost you with the bananas and you're thinking, my research is not about bananas, fair enough. Um, the, the key here is to make it easy for readers to remember 
what is what. Um, so I thought I would just share with you an example of something that I did for a client recently. Um, their research was about ratings of videos in terms of how trustworthy the video was, how informative it was, etc. Um, and the ratings were influenced by the videos being in three conditions. Either it was fully human made or it was partly automated or it was highly automated um, in its creation. And so what I did was come up with this kind of scheme. Uh, if you Google pictures of artificial intelligence, you often end up with stuff with a kind of bluey gray background that's tied to the machine and stuff, and then a kind of pinky orange color that is tied to uh, a brain or a hand or something. Um, so what I did was I created a color scheme that went from machine to human. Um, and the neat thing about blue and pink is that most people remember from school that purple is in the middle of that. Um, so that gave us a nice three conditions illustrated there. Nothing else it allowed me a wee bit of a chuckle, um, hoping that we're not going to make plots that are twisted and evil. But um, this just illustrates a way in which you can harness colours, even if it's not, um, there's no direct semantic link, you can try and put one in there. And hopefully this will make it easier for people as they're looking at the plots to remember, oh yeah, the dark blue one, that's the fully automated one, and the pink one is the, the human one. Um, so with that in mind, um, let's get coding. Um, before we do a bit of housekeeping, um, you'll find in the R community that there are different tribes. There's kind of the base R tribe, there's the Tidyverse tribe. Um, I tend to align with the Tidyverse folks, so I am going to be using Tidyverse style. I've put mostly there because we all have uh, little pet peeves as to what is the absolutely correct way of formatting stuff. We'll not worry about that too much today. Uh, we'll just get it working and get it so that it presents in a way that we can read it nicely. Um, where possible, actually throughout most of it, I'm going to use um, this notation um, in which you put the package and then a double column and then the function. Um, the reason why I'm doing this here is that it helps us see where everything comes from so that you will know, okay, I need to install this package or this package or this one's not as relevant because I don't really want to do that. Um, it's also quite a useful tip when you're coding generally in case you have packages that both have a function with the same name, um, this keeps you right and avoids any conflicts that you might otherwise end up with. So package and then function. But I will make no apology whatsoever for just loading the whole tidyverse at the very start of the code, because we're going to be using a lot of the functions um, for uh, changing, uh, just wrangling the data and then all the GTPlot stuff. Um, and it just makes it a little bit tidier if we just load the tidyverse and then we'll go from there. Um, as I said, you'll be able to apply the principles to your own plots during each exercise break and do shout um, if you get stuck. I don't know how many of you have brought along um, a little script or a basic plot that you want to start working on um, with us. If you haven't, um, then feel free to just start from my code with the Palm of Penguins and try and think um, of the context in which it might apply to you. Um, and instead of raising the penguins for the duration of the bakes and how yummy their cakes were, you could be applying that to um, something that's more meaningful to, to your own context. Um, and for each part, there is um, a reference script um, in our shared workspace that you can go to to see uh, where you might have got stuck. So um, without further ado, let's move into uh, the coding. So the reference scripts are all in here. Um, and you can come back and have a look at that um, at some point if you would like to. Um, and now I'll just start on the project. And Josie, can you just let me know if you can definitely all see the R Studio cloud? All working fine. Yeah, we can see the R Studio yeah. cloud. That's all working fine. Okay, brilliant. So I've just created a new file. And we're just going to save that file and we're going to call it Penguin Bake Off. Um, and this is where we're going to get started. So, as I said, um, oops, I'm going to make no apologies whatsoever. Oops, uh, just loading up the tidy verse at the start. There we go. Um, and I've installed all the packages that we need into the workspace, so you should be fine um, to just get started with that if you would like to. Um, then we need to get our data sorted. So, uh, we're, as I said, we're going to use the Pharma Penguins data set, and we're just going to do a quick modification on it, um, and you'll understand why very shortly. Um, so, we said that our penguins 
um, were going to be um, baking and that they were using different nuts and banana um, in, in their bakes. And um, if we just look at the Palm of Penguins data set um, just very quickly, um, we can see it up here. Actually, let's just start for now. Um, and have a quick look. So it's quite a useful data set for those of you who have not come across it. Um, it's got species, it's got islands, it's got some um, numeric values, um, and it's, it illustrates a few nice statistical things. I use it as my default for um, demonstrating things when it comes to data bits. But yeah, as I said, we're going to mark by it a little bit, because clearly the penguins did not actually get up to any baking. Um, and we're going to use the uh, mutate uh, function to add a banana quantity variable into the mix. So to do this, we're going to use um, case when, and we're going to say when the species was um, Delhi and the island was Disco, um, they were all in and put all of the green banana in <laughs> that they were given, so they put full quantity of that in. Um, when the species was Delhi and the island was a dream. They were not so sure, and so they just put half of the banana quantity in. And then when the species was a daddy and the island was uh, the last one remaining, which is Tokuso, um, they were not sure at all about this green banana business. And so they only put a very small amount that's in. So we've now got our penguins. And if we have a look at the data set again, uh, you can see that we've added a banana quantity um, variable to the end there. What I've forgotten to do is account for the species that are uh, not the Adelie penguins, and so we need to add that in as a final little case win. And for that, I'm going to use true, which is basically your catch all for anything that doesn't fit um, in the rest of it. So, any other species, uh, we are going to give them the full amount of banana. So, there we go. We've now got our penguin data set. And we're ready to pop it into a plot. Uh, we are going to plot the ripeness of the bananas, which is done by species. We're going to plot um, how much banana they put in, the baking duration, and how yummy uh, their baits were. So let's get going with that. So we've got the plot here. Um, and we're just going to use ggplot for that. So the data that we're using is a penguin data set that we have just created. And then we're going to set a few of the aesthetics right at the start here. Um, we're going to use build depth as a proxy for uh, duration. And we're going to use build length, if I can spell that properly. There we go, as a proxy for yumminess. And then we're going to use color um, for the species. Now, if we were to just run that, um, then we just get an empty plot. Um, and the reason for that is that we need to tell it what is that and what to like. We're just going to use geo point. Um, and again, let's just run that. And we've got our basic plot here um, with the penguins all dotted out. Now, we said that our penguins uh, used a different amount of banana quantity, so we need to now plot that. Um, and the way that we're going to do that is just add this as an extra aesthetic for the point here. And we're going to use alpha to change the transparency, and we're going to say alpha equals uh, the banana quantity. And just plot that again. And there you can see uh, that some of the dots have become more faded um, than other ones. So we've got the basic information um, into our plot, um, which is nice. Um, at this point, I'm going to just set the theme to minimal, which I encourage most people to do. Um, as a first point in making your uh, plots look a lot nicer. Um, the, the normal theme is absolutely fine, but this one just removes a little bit of the extra color that you don't really need. Um, and the last thing I'm going to do on this is um, set the range of the transparency, because to me, some of the faded dots just look a lot more faded than they need to. So let's just do that. Going to go from 0 0.2 to 1. And that helps them show up a little bit more clearly. And then finally, we're going to just add in some breaks because 
we only had the following three values in our data set. And so these are the only ones that we need in our legend. And there we go. So we now have um, all the data plotted. Uh, we've got the legend sitting nicely there and just telling us what we need, but nothing more. Um, I think at this point, we probably want to add a little bit more information to the plot. So we're going to give it a title um, and we're going to give it a subtitle. We're going to change the names of the axes, etc. Now, you do not want to watch me live code this. So I'm going to just um, take the liberty of copying that straight across. Um, so there we go. So I've used the, the labs um, command and we're going to pull in um, this title. Uh, banana loaf tastes best when baked with ripe or overripe bananas. So we remember that the Adeli penguins were given the green bananas. I completed the yumminess factors right at the bottom there. Um, we're going to put a subtitle in that gives us a little bit more of the story. Um, we're going to change the access labels um, to totally reinvent what it's about. And then we're going to credit the Palm Penguins package for the data, but also acknowledge that I'm totally misusing it here um, for illustration purposes. Now, let's not forget to add a little plus sign onto the end. Save this and run it again. And there we go. We have a basic plot. Um, if you find that the size there is a bit small, which I think it is, uh, we're going to just change the basic size and text is a little bit bigger. So I'm going to call this our uh, basic plot. Um, and then we can come back and check how we've improved it since then. Cara? Uh, yeah. Um, Noel's having a job getting into the RStudio Cloud workspace, and he's asked oh. if we got a GitHub link for the workspace. Uh, no, I don't, I'm afraid. All I've got is the... We've got yeah, all I've got is yeah. the RStudio yeah, Cloud. Sorry. Right, thank you. Um. But I'm more than happy to, what I will do is post all the codes up on uh, my website and put a link to somewhere on GitHub where you can find it. Um, oh, that's fine, thank you. We can link, yeah, if you send us the link, we can add that into the NHSR community GitHub pages as well so we can. Brilliant. Yeah, yeah, that would be fantastic. Thank you. That's okay. Um, so here we are. We have got our basic plot, which we can just run like that. And then if we just pull it up here, um, there we go. Now we're getting some warning messages about two rows containing missing values. Let's have a quick look at our data set and see what's going on. So yeah, we've got um, an NA value here for the bill length. And let me just sort that. Um, and that'll show us what's happening. So we've got two penguins who don't have a record of their bill length and bill depth. And these are the ones that are causing this warning message that we're getting. So we're just going to go filter them out. Again, using the very handy functions that we can get all inside the packages um, inside of us is NA bill length. So we've regenerated our penguins. And then if we call the basic plot, again, this time we don't get any warnings. So nothing has changed in the plot. So, so far, so good. Now, what we want to do next is um, apply the notion of colors um, to our plot. What we're going to do um, is go online and find some colors of um, bananas, <laughs> and then we can use those to, to plot it. So here's, here's one I prepared earlier. Um, we've got a banana plot um, here. And what I'm doing is I'm just copying um, this image of unripe to ripe bananas, and I'm going to use this tool uh, which is an online um, image color picker, the image in. Um, and what this allows me to do um, is look for a nice kind of typical yellow banana color um, and then a little green color here. Um, and let's go for a nicely ripe, let's find a good brown color for our brown bananas. Maybe something a bit better than that. There we go. Um, so these would be three colors that we could apply um, and use in our plot. Um, I'm going to just switch back to our presentation um, to show you the colors that I ended up picking uh, using exactly that system. Um, and we've got the unripe and the ripe and the overripe banana colors. 
and we can then apply those to our plots. Now, the quick fix, the quick way of seeing that is to just add scale, color, manual, and put the values in like this. And that indeed does do what we want it to do. So you remember it was the Adelis that got the green bananas and that has put the green color in the right point. Um, but the quick fix can be dangerous. So imagine you've got a super keen bean in your team, you've just got on holiday and you come back from your holiday and they say, oh, I noticed something. Uh, the, the species, that, that should have been a factor and actually it's a level factor um, and an ordered factor. So I'm just, I've just done, gone and fixed that for you in the data. Um, so they've gone and fixed that for you. And now you look at your plot and when the green, green dots are no longer green, they've turned brown. So keep your eye on the plot. I'll just flip back so you see the colors changing. Um, but this bit here um, is not changing at all. So what, is, what has happened here? What's happened is that the ordering of the factors have changed which value and gets applied to which one. So instead of doing that, we're going to create a named list. Um, so we can apply that to our banana colors. And we're going to say, if the species is a deli, this is the color we want to use. If it's chin strap, this is the color we want to use. If it's gen two, this is the color we want to use. And this keeps us safe. So you see here, whether it's factored or not, and um, the colors stay in, in exactly the right point. So I'm just going to copy these colors and take us back to our code. And we end up level section here. So we've got our banana colors here. We've got our basic plots. Um, and let's just go and add in. And rerun that. Oh no, wait a minute. <laughs> That's where that didn't work. Meant to do. Go. And what it meant to do is Okay, and now we have applied the colors to our plot, um, which is easy. So I'm just gonna yeah, pop this in here to keep me right. And okay, uh, top tip for keeping your code organized if you add. And this in front of the subsections, it makes it look like a nice little menu that's coming down there. So there we go. We have got our basic plot sorted. Um, hurrah, <laughs> it tells the story much nicer. So let's go back to our presentation. Um, choosing colors is tricky. Um, I will be the first to admit that. I find it quite difficult. Um, so here are a few starting points. You might have some department guidelines that keep you right on which colors you can use, in which case, great, someone's done the job for you, but then you might struggle to use that. Um, in the storytelling way that we've, we've talked about. Um, you can use a photo and something like image color picker to pick out colors. That is what I tend to do. Um, I find that if I look at a photo and I think, oh, those colors are nice, um, then there's only something in there that I can find to apply to a plot. Um, you can take inspiration from other data viz or art that you quite like the look of. Um, you can use Google image and uh, Google stuff like you know, whatever palette uh, you like. So if we go, um, say the peacock palettes over here. There we go. Let's just change that over. Um, it will come up with all sorts of suggestions and things you can use. Um, or we go for the sunflower. Um, I can spell that correctly. Um, there we go. So you get, you know, people have done the the work of putting these palettes together. Um, and it, sometimes that can be a nice source of inspiration for you as well. Um, or you can start from the color wheel and read around how best to use it. And I've put a blog post here um, at the bottom of the slides, um, which is unbelievably helpful uh, when you come to looking for colors that you want to use in your plots. Um, so make the most uh, of that and tools like uh, Peloton do make it a lot easier. So I'm just going to show you what that does. Um, it allows you to say, I need four colors. Um, and you can either set them all so that they're as far apart from each other as possible and move around, but that doesn't always give you the nicest plots. Um, what you can do instead is make them a little bit closer to each other um, and you end up with some colors that can be quite nice to work from. Um, so that would be my go-to if you wanted to look at colors 
um, that you didn't have a strong semantic anchoring for, um, but you wanted to look nice in combination with each other. Um, just a few quick examples of stuff that where I've done that. Um, here is one that I made about Legos. Now the colors inside this were determined by the actual Lego bricks and the sets. Uh, but what I did was I pinched the kind of background color from this and the gray uh, to make it tie in nicely. Um, and this is the, the latest one that I did with the, the Bake Off. Um, and the colors, believe it or not, are all taken from Prue's shirt. Uh, so I kind of thought if someone's done made, made a shirt that looks nice, um, why not use the, the combination of colours there? I think I did use a little bit of the, uh, the icing for, from over here uh, to make some of it as well. Um, but yeah, just different plots and different colours. Uh, but I do find that starting from an image is the, the easiest way to do that. One last thing to mention before um, I let you loose on your, your first um, exercise is to think about accessibility and about whether you're going to need to be able to see the colours when you're printing things in black and white. Um, one way to get around that is to use fewer colours and more dark and light shades in your plots. Um, and if you've got a lot of colours that you need to use, try going from one darker colour to a lighter colour and gradually blending the colours in. A bit like, remember uh, the one list with the dark blue that went to the kind of orangey pink? Um, you can do stuff like that and extend the number of colours that's in the middle of that. Um, try to apply colour semantics um, if you can. Um, but if there isn't anything obvious there, then use consistency. Um, the semantics don't necessarily need to be in the colours themselves. It can maybe be in the intensity of the colour or the darkness of the colour. For example, if you're looking at an increase um, in drug dose, then you might want to put um, the, the higher doses as the darker colour. Um, just It's all about making it easier for the reader to, to map the colours onto the, the concepts that are behind them. Um, so there we go, we've, used, we've looked at using colour purposefully um, and we've gone from a plot in which we had to try and remember which um, data points corresponded to which types of bananas to one in which it's, it's pretty obvious which ones are which. And we're going to cover the second tip and it'll take us about 30 seconds um, and then you can go and um, have a go at your exercise. But do we have any questions about colours at this point? Josie, can you keep me right? Nope, there's nothing in the chat at the moment. Okay, brilliant. Great. Um, so we talked about orientations earlier when we were looking at the baking duration, so the time spent in the oven. The good news is if you've built your plot in ggplot, most of the time, in order to change it around, all you need to do is add an extra line um, to flip your coordinates. This makes it nice and easy to go from a bar chart where you kind of wanted to tilt your head to try and figure out what's going on to one in which it's more obvious. Um, that Gen 2 didn't leave the cakes in the oven for quite as long as the others did. Um, we've done this already. We've got duration going along the x-axis and yumminess going along the y-axis, so we can just give ourselves a nice little pat on the back um, and congratulate ourselves that we're on the right track with our penguin bake-off. Um, so we've covered the first two principles that I think actually make, they make a big difference. Regardless, of, we've not added any text whatsoever to our plot, but we've already helped clarify the story uh, by making sure that the, the Points are memorable in terms of what they anchor to, um, and that the, the stuff is all in sensible orientations. So I'm going to hand over to you um, at this point, um, and I'm going to ask you to have a look at the, the plots. Maybe you've brought a plot with you, maybe you've started working on one, maybe you've just got one in mind. Um, I'm going to go and have a think about the orientation. Does the X and the Y make sense, or would it be better to flip them? Um, I want you to try and choose a color scheme that you think is appropriate for your plot. Um, and I want you to try and use this named list approach um, for applying the color scheme to your plot. Um, so I suggest we reconvene in 15 minutes. I'll set this timer running uh, once we're all happy to go. Um, Josie, does that sound good at this point? Yep, no, that sounds like a good plan. Should I pause okay. the recording for this bit and then we'll pick uh, up? Yes, good idea. Yeah, if you pause that um, and then we will all come back. So yeah, see you. Okay, brilliant. Um, so we've covered using colour purposefully and we've covered using um, intuitive orientations. Um, the next thing that I want us to try and do is to add a bit of colour to our text uh, to help orient our readers when they come across our plots. So at this point, I'm going to introduce you to the GG text uh, package. GG text is my go-to for annotating plots. Um, I really like it. It's really flexible. 
Um, you can control the alignment of your text within the box. You can control how the box aligns to the coordinate that you give it. Um, you can change the color, the background, the transparency. Um, and you can use Markdown and CSS within it, which is where it really comes into its own in terms of annotating plots and changing text um, within the, the title and the subtitle of what, we, what we've got. So let's just go back to our coding example um, and we will apply a bit of ggtext magic. Um, so we have here um, our title, um, which says that none of it tastes better than beef with ripe or overripe bananas. And let's just remind ourselves of what our plot looks like. It's here. Um, so that's fine. What we're going to try and do is make the word ripe um, match the yellow color and the word overripe match the brown color because that will signal to the readers, yes, you did get this right. You did correctly interpret um, the colors of the bananas. So in order to do that, uh, we're going to use ggtext and apply a bit of CSS to our title. Um, what we're going to do is override the title that we had in our basic plot and add some CSS within it. So the stuff at the start, we're going to keep the same. Um, actually, I'm just going to copy this across and talk you through it because it'll be much less painful <laughs> than watching me um, type it. So. Uh, banana loaf tastes better when baked with. Um, and then we're going to put either side of the word ripe, we're going to put a little CSS span um, that opens here and closes here, um, which will um, allow us to read in the color um, of the chin strap bananas, which is the, uh, the ripe. Uh, these are the ones that were given the ripe bananas. So let me just um, show you. Um, we're gonna, I'm going to paste all this together. I'm using paste here rather than glue um, just to avoid um, any extra dependencies. Um, a piece of space zero just means it doesn't put any spaces between the different chunks of text that you put in. Otherwise, you end up with lots of spaces everywhere. So let's just have a look at what this text looks like. Um, do that again. So I grab the end bracket by mistake. Okay, so this, if any of you have done any web design or have a look, had a look at the code behind the websites, um, you might recognize some of this. Um, but this is just kind of CSS or HTML coding to change the color um, of the word ripe. And so let's run our plot and see what happens. Um, and that didn't work. <laughs> and the reason why that didn't work, it just printed in um, exactly what we told it in the text. And um, so that's not what we want to do. Um, what we want to do is use ggtext element markdown within the theme. So we're going to go back into our theme and change things up a little bit. And instead of, so normally the plot title is in element text, what we're going to do is use ggtext element markdown. And ta -da! we have right and overwrite bananas um, in yellow and in brown, which is exactly what we were aiming for. So well done us. Um, what I find with this is that if you're using a color, it makes it look like the text isn't as bold as the rest, as the, the darker text. Um, so to counteract that, we're just going to make these words bold. Um, so let's find the words we've got over right here. And to make things bold using markdowns, and that's all you need to do is add two asterisks on either side. And again, GG text in all its brilliance uh, picks up on this as well. So you can use a combination of markdown and CSS if you want to. Let's do that again. And there we go. So now we've got the words right and over right coming out in bold. Um, and it just looks a lot, a lot neater. Um, so using color um, to help our readers orient themselves. And um, it's nothing particularly fancy, but it does signal to them, yes, you interpreted that correctly. Um, and depending on the nature of your plot and how complicated it is, sometimes that's quite a nice way of avoiding having too many extra labels and annotations if you can just pop the text um, in, in the right color. So that when they're reading it, they immediately know what it is that they're looking at. So that's adding text, adding color to our text. Um, and the other thing that we want to do um, with our text just now um, is add some different fonts and some different colors to the rest of the text to add a bit of text hierarchy. Now, text hierarchy is one of those things it's much easier to demonstrate than it is to describe. So take a look at this image. 
Um, and what you see here is that the way the text is formatted will guide you into reading some bits first and some bits last, or maybe even skipping over other bits of it. Um, again, I've popped a blog post down at the bottom here if you want to look into this in more detail, um, which, yeah, it just goes into text hierarchy and how that works, not at all from a, a data viz point of view, but from um, just a design point of view, which I find really quite interesting to read. Um, so here you see the big bold text you'll probably go to first, and then this stuff, and then this, and you'll probably read this last, and then you might not even bother um, with this bit here. So what you need to figure out in your plot is which bits do I want to go the, the readers to go straight to? What is the main story that really needs to hit home? Um, which bits am I less interested in? Which bits does it not really matter if they don't read? We would like to think that they will read absolutely everything, but they won't. They'll skip over some stuff. So you need to be in control um, of what they're going to skip over and what they're not, not going to bother with. The plot, as it currently stands, is really quite busy. And so when I look at it, I'm not entirely sure um, which bits to focus on first. You know, there's, there's just a lot of text and a lot going on. Um, so I think adding a wee bit of text hierarchy is really going to help us here. Um, so in order to do this, we need to add a few colours for our text. So we'll go back to our colour scheme here. Um, and what I'm going to do is base our text colours on our archetypal banana colour, um, the, the yellow. And we're going to create a dark text colour. And we're also going to create a light text colour. And the way that we're going to do this is we're going to use a package uh, called Monochroma that I built um, to help with exactly this kind of stuff. So we're going to start with the banana color that corresponds to the chin strap penguins. And we're going to say go darker. And we're going to create um, three, no, let's just do two colors. I think that's all we need now. And first, we're just going to take a look and see what that looks like. So there we go. Let's do that. Okay. So here we've got a, um, a dark colour, which retains, I think, about 10% of the original colour uh, while going a lot darker. So it's, it, it ties in um, to it nicely. Again, you could just pick different colours from your, from your image or whatever you've used as your starting point. But um, I find it quite nice to use, use colours for the text that are tied to the, the rest of the colours in the plot. So we've got our dark text colour. Um, and for it, we're going to use the, the second colour. Um, so this is one and this is two. We're going to use colour number two. Let me just get rid of that there. And then for our light text colour, um, what we're going to do is start um, from the dark text and go lighter. Okay, so for the light for the dark text, we've started from a, a key colour and gone darker. And for the light text, we're going to start from the dark text and go lighter. So again, generate palettes, uh, and we're going to start from our dark text colour. And we're going to go lighter. Um, and this time we're going to create three colors. And we will see why in just a minute. Um, so if we have a look here, um, so we've got our three colors. If you were to use that third color, which is the one that you would get if you just chose two, um, that would be too light. You, know, you wouldn't really able to read, uh, really be able to read that text clearly enough. Um, so instead of doing that, we're going to use this middle color here, which is where we've made three. So we've got three colours, and we can pick colour number two from the middle of that. And then we're just going to um, update this. So we've got a light text colour. And we've got a dark text colour. There we go. And what I maybe should have specified is that monochrome here just gives us a hex code. For these. So um, here you can see if I pull that, um, this hex code here corresponds to, oops, to this bit down here. Um, so we now have a dark text color and a light text color. Bananas. Actually, let's just feed that whole thing into monochrome. Um, view palette. Uh, banana colors. There we go. So these are the colours that we're working for. And it's funny because suddenly our, our ripe bananas don't seem brown compared to the, the darker brown that we've got here, but they do still work well um, in our, in our visualisations. So we've got some colours that we can use. Um, and now what we need to do is just go and apply those um, within our 
um, plot. So if I was to regenerate the plot just now, now that I've updated our banana colors, um, you can see something fun happen, uh, which is that you then get the dark text and the light text down here, which we do not want. So we need to go back into scale color manual and we need to set limits equals force, which is something that I learned and the first time I looked into these materials you know, a few months ago, um, that this is a new way of dropping colors apparently. So if we just put that in, then the dark text and the light text colors have disappeared from our legend, which is great because we don't want them to be there. We only want colors that are actually associated with data points um, to remain in our plot. So there we go, so far so good. Um, and next we're going to change the base text color of our plot. So let's do that within the theme. So theme element um, text, and we can change the color. The banana colors, light text, and oh, where did that part? Oh yes, so there we go. Where's that? There we go. So all of our text has now gone to this light text color um, that we had chosen, which isn't really what we want to do. What we want to do now is um, add some dark color back in to the title and just turn here so we can see what we're doing. Dark text. Uh, there we go. So now we've got a darker title and lighter text everywhere else. Now there really aren't any limits into how many different variants on your text color you can put in. Um, some people like to use a lot, some people like to use a few. I've only used two in our example here, but you might find that you want three, you might want something that's even lighter than this. Um, you might want a halfway house and it's entirely up to you. But hopefully this gives you a bit of an indication as to how you can A, pick your colors and B, um, then apply them to your text. Now we've got the basic um, ggplot font going on here. I'm just gonna change that um, for us. So let's just realign everything to where it should be. And um, here we've got element text. I'm gonna change our main text to um, cabin. See what that looks like. Yeah, it's a little bit more friendly and rounded, um, and it's kind of nice to get away from the, the defaults um, if we can. Um, and then we're also going to change the family in our title, um, and we're going to go for poppins instead. It's a nice, friendly, um, friendly text. There we go. Um, that didn't quite work as planned, but that's okay, I know why. Um, and the reason why I know why is that fonts can be a real pain um, to work with. So before we go too much further um, with that, let's just go and fix fonts. So in the, the reference scripts that you've got here, um, there is a font here about setting up your fonts. Um, the way that we use fonts has changed quite a bit um, in recent history of using R um, and R Studio. And the, we'll come to that in a minute. I'm just going to make this run and then we'll cover um, what we need to after that. So that tells us which fonts are installed. This allows us to register a font if we want to. And if you've been nosing around the folders, you might see that I've included a font file in here. So I'm just going to register that. Um, and then that will tell me we have registered Poppins Bold as our font. And I will go back to Penguin Take Off, rerun our plot, and there we go. So we now have um, our font rendered um, at the start. And as you can see, it adds a wee bit of text hierarchy again to use a slightly different font. Uh, this one's a bit more heavy um, than, than the other font that we've got um, underneath that. I will come back to explain what happened there. Just a minute. Um, before we go any further with exploring fonts, however, um, I think it's important that we take an extra step, um, which is to export our plot. We, I said in the uh, blurb about this workshop that I would show you how to export, export your plots um, to a good quality. Um, and what we're going to do is use ggsave to do that. So I'm going to render the plot again and then use ggsave. And here we'll find in our files, a new file has appeared called Penguin Bake Off. Um, 
which allows us to see exactly how it looks once it's rendered to the dimensions that we want. Because there's nothing more disheartening than spending all your time making your plot looking nice, look nice in here. And then you export it. And because of the size of the export, everything moves around, the font size is not right, um, and it looks a bit of a mess. So well, now that we've got all that sorted, um, we can have a look and see what our plots look like. I'm going to hide this, give us a bit more space. There we go. There's something in the chat. Uh, let's just yeah, we go on to um, fonts. Sam's asked whether you have a favourite font to use. That's a good question. Um, I have several fonts that I quite like. Um, there's the fonts that I've used in my on my website that I use on my slides. Um, there is, I quite like Poppins actually. Poppins is the title that I've used um, in our plot here. Um, it's, it's maybe slightly goofy for something in a serious uh, context, but I just really like how friendly it is. Um, Lato is a really good font that a lot of people use, um, but because a lot of people use it, some people think it's a bit boring. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about how to choose good fonts um, in a minute, uh, but I think the key is to make sure that it's something that's easily readable um, that's not too wide and spread out, and neither is it too narrow. If it's too narrow, it's really busy. Uh, and if it's too wide, then it kind of takes your brain a wee bit too long to get to the end of, of what you're trying to read. Um, that would be my go-to. Um, but yeah, I realise that didn't really give you a list of fonts to try, but um, give Lato a bash if you're looking for something that's very standard, but still a bit interesting. Um, Inter is quite nice, I-N-T-E-R. Um, and it's also got an intertype version, which is slightly more compressed, but without looking like a compressed font. Um, and that's really good if you've got a lot of information that you want to fit in, um, but you don't want it to take up too much space. So there we go. A few options for you to, for you to have a look at. Um, OK, so where are we? Oh, yes. We've created our plot. Um, and that seems to be working fine but I would quite like the title size um, to be a little bit bigger. So I'm going to go ahead and change that, that because I think that will make it look um, even more, uh, yeah, just the way it should do. So make that size 18. Okay. And then we're going to export that and refresh. Um, and we see we now have a problem, which is that our text goes off the edge um, of the screen um, or the edge of our plot. But again, this isn't really a problem. It's a fairly easy thing to fix. All we need to do is find the point at which we need to add a little line break. And as we did earlier, we will regenerate our plot and then we can have a look, check. And yeah, there we go. That's that problem solved. So we've added a little bit of text hierarchy um, into this and I think it works quite nicely. Um, the next thing that I think we need to do is apply the same principle to the axis text. So let's just go and do that. Um, and I'm just going to move all of this actually. It's looking messier than I would like. There we go. So axis text, uh, we're going to go element text. I'm going to change the size to six. And I'm also going to reapply the color because I think the minimal theme um, applies a different color on top. So let's go have a look to see what that is. Okay, so that's made the access text small. We talked earlier about um, there might be some things that doesn't matter if your readers skip over. I think in this plot, the main things that we're interested in are where the data tends to come together and what the trends are. So I'm not actually as interested in the values along the axes, which is why I'm taking the liberty of making them a little bit smaller. If we look at our rendered plots, again, this is where we were. This is it where we are now. It just makes it a little bit less busy um, and allows you to focus on the real story, which is um, that green bananas don't taste nice <laughs> if you're doing it, if you're making a loaf um, with them. So there we go. We've added a wee bit of text hierarchy. Now let me go back to the presentation and talk about fonts. Getting custom fonts to work can be one of the most frustrating things uh, when you're working in R and using databases. Things have improved um, dramatically recently. The old workflow of using, using extra font and importing your fonts one by one um, seems to have been superseded now by using uh, RAG and system fonts and text shaping. So you need to make sure, I think when you install RAG, it should install all the other ones that are here as well. Um, and you want to also set your graphics device to HEG. So I'll just show you where you do that. Uh, it's in tools. 
global options, graphics, and then you've got a drop down here. And so set it to ATG, um, and that should work um, fine. And that'll make it play nicely across the viewer here, across any markdown documents that you're creating. Um, and in the markdown documents, you should specify as well at the start of it which graphic device you want to be using, um, and that'll help it all play. And play nicely together. Um, I, as I've said, there's a little script in here about setting up fonts and registering variants. I've just finished a project with a client who had a compressed version of a light font, which just was really hard to get to work. Once we got it working, it was fine. Um, and the way that we did that was to use system fonts register variant, um, which again, I've detailed in, um, in that script file. So you can go and have a look at that um, at any point that you like to. And the same as colors. Oh, sorry, his question. Yep. Yeah. Sam just popped up another question asking, are there any options for kerning and letter slash word spacing? Yes, there are. So um, this blog post here is absolutely brilliant um, for showing you how you can, oh, sorry, I'm not showing the right screen. <laughs> there we go, presentation. Um, the, the blog post that I've linked at the bottom here is absolutely brilliant um, for showing you how to change all sorts of things about your fonts. Um, it goes into how to debug stuff if it's not working, choosing the graphics design device, as I've just talked about, um, using NR Markdown in Quarto, um, installing custom fonts. It even does stuff about um, Font Awesome and using um, icons. And to answer your question, there's a whole load of stuff here about um, how you can change the aspects of the text. So here, for example, the numbers get realigned um, so they're all aligned nicely. You can change the spacing. You can change basically everything. Um, I'm not going to go into it here, but I highly recommend um, reading this post. I'm just going to pop a wee link to it um, in the chat, and then you can have a look at that um, in your own time. Did that answer the question <laughs> in a roundabout way? Great, thanks, Sam. That's brilliant. Um, so we, we've got our scripts, we've got our fonts. Um, and as I said, choosing a font can be tricky, let alone getting it to work uh, once you've chosen it. So again, you might have some brand guidelines within your department. There might be some fonts that you're supposed to be using, in which case, brilliant, someone's done the, the hard work for you there. But again, check whether they really work nicely for data biz. Um, there's a nice blog post um, on data wrapper about uh, fonts to avoid and fonts to stick with. Again, it doesn't tell you these are the ones to use. It just gives you broad, broad principles that you can look at when you're trying to choose which fonts you want. Um, you can use websites and inspector tools. Um, so if you find a website where you think that font looks really good, you can just have a look and see, uh, see what they've done. So let's just have a look here as an example. Uh, if you click on and if you right click and then hit inspect, it brings up this kind of thing and then you can search for the font. So there we go. So the font on this website is Atkinson Hyperlegible, which sounds appropriate for, <laughs> for a website that you want people to be reading. Um, and you can apply this. Uh, there you go. Here you go to my slides, also HTML, so we can have a look and see my fonts that are here. So this is the main text font. And then if we have a look at the, the title, Again, it tells us what the font is um, up here. So that's quite a neat trick as well. If you find a font combination that you think looks really good, just go ahead and figure out what it is. Um, the other resource that I would recommend highly is Oliver Schumdorfer's website. Um, he runs a, yeah, he's, he's just a great consultant when it comes to fonts and design. And um, he has a Friday mailing list. So every Friday I get an email with a, a new font to have a look at. And he's really good in the way that he talks about where the font will work. Um, is it good for titles? Is it good for text? Is it good for user, uh, user interfaces, et cetera? Um, and he has an article exploring the font matrix, um, which makes it fun and um, <laughs> and also makes it understandable. Um, so I highly recommend his work as well. And there's a link to it um, at the bottom of the slides there. Um, but the basic premise of the font matrix is choose font, pair fonts together if they have roughly the same shape. So you see the O's are all nicely rounded here. It doesn't matter whether they're serif or slab or whatever. Um, it's about the, the shape. Um, yeah, the underlying frame of the letters. But Look at what Oliver does and how he explains it because he makes much more sense of that, but that would be a sensible starting point, I would say. So we've added a bit of text hierarchy um, and in doing so, we've gone from, from a plot which was um, quite busy 
and there was a lot of text going on there to something that's a bit more legible um, where you get to see, okay, this is the main story. Um, these are extra bits of information that I need to look at. The access is maybe not quite as interesting or not quite as important. Um, and I just find it much less overwhelming than this original bot um, that we had here. You're more likely to read the information that really matters when it's been formatted like this. So um, we've now covered the, our second two points uh, to add some color to our text to help orient our readers and use colors and fonts to add a bit of text hierarchy. Um, I'm going to suggest that we take another 15 minute break where you go and try and apply this uh, to your own thoughts. Does that sound like a good time? Lucy, can you keep me right? Yep, yep that, that looks good. Sounds good. Okay, so think about the main message of your plot. When you're writing your title, you want people to be able to walk away having just read the title and having got an important part of the message. Okay, so your title doesn't say, here is some data about blah. Um, your title should say something more informative. Now, fair enough, if you're publishing an academic journal, the title might be taken care of in the text underneath the plot, etc. But still, have a think about what you want that main message to be. Um, and then I suggest you choose a font or two. And um, if you use system fonts, system fonts, and um, that will tell you which fonts are already installed either on your device um, or in the, the cloud uh, space that we've been using. Um, don't spend too long trying to pick a font because it's the same as colors. You could just spend forever doing it, but pick a few fonts that you think look good. Um, or if you think they look horrendous, that's fine as well. <laughs> and part of it is just getting through the mechanics of applying a font to your plot. Um, add some text hierarchy colors to your color scheme. I suggest just adding those into our named list um, again, and then try and apply the colors to the different theme elements um, as we have done in our plot. Do we have any questions before I let you loose on your text hierarchy assignment? All quiet, all quiet. Oh, Josie? Nope, I was just gonna say it's all quiet in the chat. <laughs> okay, brilliant. Well, in that case, I'll set the timer running and I will see you all in um, and great, so the recording is starting again and we can go back to the presentation and see um, how we get on. Kathy said he didn't finish it, that's fine. These are really short timelines. Like I think for me to get the plot right, so the, the Bake Off one that I showed you earlier, I did that in about five hours. Um, so it does take a lot of time to um, make sure that you've got it all, all sorted. But the beauty of some of this is that you can then package it up um, into a theme that you're gonna reuse time and time again. Um, I'll talk more about that at the, the in-person conference, actually. But um, yeah, once you've done the hard work of figuring out the font combinations that you like and how to use color like this, um, you can then recycle it for, for future plots if you're using something that's in the same style. So none of this is, um, is wasted time. As one of these things, the more you do it, the quicker you get um, at doing it. So um, in this last uh, part, we're going to be talking about um, annotating our plots. Um, those of you who don't love um, data wrangling, we're going to do a bit of data wrangling here, um, but um, I'll try and go through it slowly. And if you get stuck or if you don't understand anything, please just put your hand up and um, Josie will keep an eye out for you and we'll go over stuff again because I just I really want to make this as useful as I can um, for you. So we've added some colour to our text and we've used colours and fonts to add some hierarchy. Um, and now we're going to try and reduce and the unnecessary eye movements by adding some text boxes just at the right point to highlight the key things that we want people to find in our data. Um, so there we go. Oh, we have a plot. A plot from Sam. <laughs> so have a quick look. I can save it on my desktop in a way that I can see it. Uh, Sam, are you wanting me to have a look at this? Oh, nice. Do you mind if I share that? Is that okay? Cool, thank you very much. Well, I'll stop my screen share and I'll just share um, Sam's plot because I think it's actually really neat. There we go. Um, so can everybody see Sam's plot? So you've picked some nice vibrant colors. I like it, um, it stands out quite nicely. Um, urban and rural, maybe I'm thinking sunflowers in the countryside and uh, more kind of bluey grey tones for the, the town. Um, so that sticks nicely. 
and you've changed the colours in text and you've done a bit of font shaping as well. Um, again, I think those fonts look good. They're maybe a wee bit on the um, compressed side, um, but it will allow you to get a lot of information there um, as you want to. So yeah, nice job. And the theme mineral behind the facets is working nicely as well. You can um, you can change the colours of um, like the strip text background and all that kind of stuff. You can look into all of that um, in due course if you want to. But um, yeah, these look great. I think these are brilliant. Um, so yeah, the next step, I guess, would be to try and change some of the extra colours to, to just tie it all back in rather than that neutral grey. Um, but good job. It's always nice to see uh, when someone someone gets it um, and uh, yeah, applies it really well. So well done. Um, Roboto. Okay, yeah, Roboto font gets used quite a lot. Um, and yeah, it's nice. Um, but again, just have to make sure that it's not too, too squished. Um, to, to allow people to process stuff while they're reading it. Um, but yeah, great. Okay, I am going to share um, the presentation screen again. Um, and we'll see where we got to. So here we are. We've got, um, we've got our plot and we've got all the information in there, but all the information is around the outsides um, of the plot. So we have to kind of jump a little bit between the text and the, the plots that are in there. Uh, what we're going to try and do is combine um, everything that we've talked about for um, in order to create um, some text boxes that we can then put on the, the plot and that will help us remove um, some of the legend and some of the extra text that we've got as a subtitle. So um, I'm going to just actually switch back to our, our studio space. Um, so we have our data up here and what we're going to do is create some summary data that we can then pull in. Um, so the way that we're going to do this, uh, what we want to do really is put a text box here, one here, and one here, um, that point out which team the penguins are in and give us a bit of information about what they were doing. So we're going to create um, a data frame that we're then going to feed in. And this will all make sense in terms of why we have the aesthetics fed in at the top of our plot. So farm penguins, starting from the penguins data set again. And we're just going to group them uh, by species. And then we are going to summarize a few things. So we're going to grab the mean bill depth um, and the mean bill length per species. Um, there we go. And we remember there were a few NAs in the original data set. So we're just going to get rid of those so they don't get in our way. And we're going to do the same thing again for the bill length. And let's just run that and take a quick look. So we've got, as we expect, for each species, the mean depth and the mean length. Um, and then what we want to do is add some commentary on that so that we can tell a bit of story about each of the penguins in our data set. So again, we're going to use mutate along with case when. And we're going to, so let's just actually give it um, a variable, variable name. So commentary equals case when species equals Delhi. So when the species is Delhi, and I'm just going to pull the text through here. Um, so when the species is Adeli, we want to write this text in. So the Adeli penguins try burying the matter banana in the mix. Turns out even a hint of green banana is detrimental to yumminess. That's what we're going to put over the, tech, the data that's here. Then we need to do the same thing again for when the species is the Gen 2. Um, so again, I'm just going to pull that text across, uh, which says that overwrite bananas uh, they had overripe bananas and slightly less baking times, and uh, so shorter baking times. And then for the, the last remaining one, we're just going to use that true catch all. Um, and we're going to talk about them having used oops, ripe bananas and slightly longer baking times. So that'll be the chin straps. And um, with that, so let's have a quick look now uh, at what our data frame looks like. Yes, on your species. Oh, that's it. Thank you. Yes, perfect. Thank you very much. Um, penguin summary. So there we go. We've got the species. We've got the mean 
um, build depth, build length, and then we've got the commentary in here um, that we were talking about earlier. Does that did that make sense to everybody in terms of the the data wrangling that we did there? Can I get a couple of thumbs up if people are still with me? Yeah, brilliant. Okay, so. Um, we took the penguins, we grouped them by species, we summarized to get the means, um, and then we added some commentary. The reason why we got the means was because we want the text boxes to be right in the middle of these clusters of dots. Okay, so we've got our penguin summaries data, um, and we can now try to add these in as text boxes. So we've got our basic plot here uh, with our labels, and let's just do that. So again, this is a ggtext thing. Um, so geom text box, and this time the data is the penguin summaries that we just created. And in terms of the aesthetics, we still want the color to be species, and we still want the x to be uh, bill depth and the y to be bill length. And so we just need to change um, the label. And the label here is going to be, um, we're going to say the team that they're in, and then we're going to add the commentary in. So remember earlier, we did a bit of and pasting. We're going to do the same thing again here. Um, and we're going to see, let's just do this to start with. Oops. In the brackets, the team, and then space, and then species. And then let's just close that here. Looks like it will render nicely. OK, so we've got our text boxes here. Um, and remember, the coordinates are just coming from the means that we've just calculated. Um, and then we get the teams that we've added in. Um, and it's bold because we put the double asterisks either side. Everybody follow how that, how that worked? Um, OK, so then the next thing that we need to do uh, is add our commentary in. So I suggest at this point um, we add a little line break in. And then commentary in. Let's see what it does. OK, so there we've got the team, the species, and then the commentary. And then we're just all pulling all of this in uh, from this little data frame that we've just created. And I find using a data frame like this quite a useful way of creating text boxes. I find otherwise it just gets a little bit unwieldy if you're looking through different, you know, if you create a different data set for each box, um, it just gets a wee bit messy, whereas keeping it like this is just nice and tidy. So. And um, we've added that in. Now, what I want to do is style it a little bit. So I don't really want everything to be the color of the species. So I'm going to just overwrite um, that color by using the span um, system that we used earlier. So I'm just going to grab that here. You can see what I've done. So um, instead of having just the commentary on its own, we're surrounding the commentary with some CSS code that will apply the light text color to it. Do that. Great. OK, so we've changed the color. That seems to be working fine. Um, and now we want to go and style our text. So we're going to change the font. Unfortunately, the Geom text box doesn't read in the base font that we've given to our plot. So we just need to change that again. Uh, we'll go for cabin, because that's what we've been using. We'll make the size a wee bit smaller. Um, we're going to set the width of the boxes just because we don't want them to spread across too much of the data. Um, and I'm going to use the lines unit for this, for this just because it keeps it nice and relevant to the text size that we're using. And I'm also going to make the boxes um, slightly transparent so that we can see the data uh, behind them. There we go. That looks all right. I'm um, still a little bit messy, so I think I'm just going to take off the box contour. And you do that by just changing the box color, color to an A. The box color is just the contour of the box, uh, whereas the color that you feed inside it, in our case, is the, the species color um, and the color of the text. So let's just render that um, with our GG save. This is what we had, um, and this is what we have now. So we've just added the, the text boxes in. Um, it's messed up a few things in our legend, but that's OK, because we're going to get rid of that because we've put all the information that we need into these boxes. Um, so let's go and change our subtitle. Oh, where are we? Title. There we go. 
So we've talked about how the penguins will get different types of bananas within the boxes, and we've talked about which penguins get what inside the boxes. So we can remove a bunch of that um, from the subtitle that we had earlier. I'm just going to grab the text from over here. There we go. Um, because that's another bit of live coding that I don't think is helpful for anyone. Um, so that's our subtitle massively reduced because we've captured a lot of the information in here. So again, let's have a look at our plot, where we were, where we are now. It's just a lot less overwhelming. And um, so I think that was worth doing. Um, and then we're also going to remove the lead because we've covered all of that information again. Uh, now, there are so many different ways of removing legends um, on ggplots. It was a, a fun discussion over Twitter uh, fairly recently. Um, you choose your own. <laughs> pick, pick whichever way you want to remove the legend. You can remove legends from some of them. You can This one removes the legend um, across the board. So if we have a look at where we were and where we are now, we've got a plot that still contains all the information, um, but it's just much more streamlined. Um, and I think makes it a lot easier for people to just see um, what's going on without having to jump from um, one bit to the next. Um, I think my caption is still a bit big, so I'm just going to go and change the size of that. There we go. Let's see. Yeah, that's better. That's better. See, it's just, it's always the small things. And that make all the difference and that take up at least half the time, if not more, uh, when you're trying to create a good publication worthy database. And so there we go, we've reduced some eye movement. Um, and I think in doing so, we've gone from a plot that was um, fairly busy uh, to a plot that's more streamlined. And it's actually easier to read the information because you're just pointing people to a smaller chunk of information at every step. Now, you might have strong guidelines in your department or in the journal that you're submitting to that says no, we need a legend, in which case that's fine. This is just an example of stuff that you can do. Um, but it's worth considering whether you can label the, da the data more directly than having it sit um, outside the plot. So we've reduced some eye movement, um, and now we're going to go in and highlight some important uh, data points. So. This is a fun thing to do, and we're going to do a bit of text manipulation as well as data wrangling. So again, those of you who don't love that side of things, um, I'm hoping that this will in, um, entice you to uh, make friends with uh, some of these data wrangling functions that we can that we can use. Um, a really neat way of looking at your data if you want to try and figure out the coordinates of a point is to use plot these ggplotly. So I'll just show you that um, just now in our coding space. So we've generated our plot, um, and all we need to do now is call Plotly, Plotly, and there we go. So Geom Textbook is not currently supported by Plotly, and that's that's fine. We don't need it. All we're looking for here are the coordinates of interesting points that we wanted to, to look at. So say you wanted to highlight this one here, you just hover over it, and it'll tell you the coordinates that you are looking for, and you can make a note of that, and then filter your data into to just highlight that or um, yeah, whatever it is that you want to do. I find this quite a useful way of doing it. Um, in our plot, we're going to take the easy route and highlight our star baker, um, the runner up, and the penguin who had to leave the tent um, this week, unfortunately, the green bananas, which is not, not a great combination. Um, so uh, we're going to start by creating a new data set um, so that we can um, highlight just the important penguins that we're looking at. And just as I go about that, do we have any questions? No, there's nothing in the chat. Great. Perfect, thank you. So, um, for our penguin highlights, um, is that spell it right? Yes, I think so. Uh, <laughs> we are going to start from the more complex um, data set that we have in the public penguins. Um, so how we're this raw data set. Um, this is, um, yeah, it has more information in it for each penguin. Um, and you can see that the, the names of the variables are also not um, formatted in the same way, and they're actually using different uh, different word for the bill. Um, so we need to go in and change the, these um, column names so that they will match up nicely with the rest of the data. 
content that we are using. So let's first of all do a bit of tidying up. I'm going to use the janitor package and the clean names function, um, which you'll see is pretty magical. Um, what it does is it removes any spaces, replaces them with an underscore. Uh, it's also got rid of brackets that we had around the millimeters. Um, and it just means that you don't have to try and remember which ones were capitalized and which ones weren't because none of them are. Um, so that's quite a useful little package and function to, to use if you're doing much data wrangling. And um, we're then going to rename some of our variables so that they match. So to use the rename function, we give it the new name. Uh, so build depth so that it matches our existing data. And we give it our old name. So this is the name that it currently has, and this is the name that we want it to have. Um, and then we're going to do the same here. Okay, so that has just renamed those two um, those two columns, um, and it's quite nice because it doesn't create extra columns. Sometimes I used to just create extra columns with a new name that were the same content, but the renaming function is a much neater way of doing that. So once we've done that, we want to filter for the penguins that we're interested in. So I'm just going to copy this across and I'll talk you through what we're doing. So we are filtering for first of all the star baker, and this is the penguin that had the maximum yumminess score. Um, we then want our runner-up. So this is the one for whom when we sort the data uh, by yumminess score is number two, that's our runner-up. And then we also want the penguin who leaves the tent, which is the one that had the minimum score on what we're using for our yumminess variable. So let's have a look now and see where we are. We've got the penguin highlights. We've just got our three penguins in, which are the penguins that we were interested in. Um, we've got the names, IDs, and um, we've got the new build length and um, build depth that we've just renamed so that it matches our existing data um, and a bit of extra information. So you'll notice here that the species um, are worded differently to the species that we have in our data set um, in, the, in the summaries, for example. So if we were to feed this in and just say to color by species, it would not recognize these species as being the same as these ones, and we would end up with a bunch of um, any colors. So what we need to do is just change the way that the species are organized. Let's change the names. And we're doing a bit of reg regex, regex. I'm going to go with regex. Um, what we're doing here is we're saying, take everything up to the first um, space and everything after it, and just re give us everything that was before the first space. So it's it's basically separating the string into before the space and after the space and returning the species. And when we do that, species are now exactly as we need them to be. Is everyone still with me in this bit of data wrangling madness? I think so. Yes, great. Excellent. You're doing well for a Friday afternoon. This is good. Um, Okay, so now that we've done that, we now have our three, oops, where have we got? We've got our three penguins that we want to highlight. And what we want to do now is add a little bit of commentary so that we've got some text that we can add into our text box. So we are going to use our old friend, uh, Case When. And we're going to say when the length is equal to the maximum the length. Um, then we are going to talk about our star figure. Uh, let me just pull in the text. So, talking about star baker, and we are going to say that our star baker, oh, our star baker is um, this penguin here. Um, they are from this species, from this island, and um, congratulate them. So that feels like the right thing to do uh, for your for your star baker. And so let's just do that now and we can have a look and see what it's done. So here's our commentary. So our star baker is, and it's pulled in the penguin's ID from the ID column, which is somewhere along here. Uh, where's it gone? Anyway, 
you can have another look for that at some point in the future when I'm not just scrolling around. Um, there it is. There it is. So it's pulled in the ID. Uh, it's pulled in the species. Um, and we know that they're the, the top ranking penguin. And we're just going to do the same thing for our um, runner up. So this is the penguin who had the second highest score. Um, and again, we're pulling in the species, what island they live on, and their ID, um, which is good. And then for the last penguin, I'm going to do the same thing again. Um, and we're going to say, oops. So we're pulling in um, their ID, and we're going to say they did not have a good baking day, and they're going to be the one who has to leave the tent. One too many brackets at the end there, I think. Uh, let's just run that and see. So we've got our penguin highlights and we've got all the data that we need and we've got the commentary added in using information that was inside that data frame. I really like doing this kind of text manipulation with R. Um, I think it's quite fun <laughs> because you end up um, being able to create some quite fun sentences automatically and make it look very human, um, even though it isn't necessarily particularly human. So let's go back to our plots and figure out what we want to do. So this. We have a penguin here, so we want to put a text box here talking about our runner-up. So we're going to anchor that text box around this data point and this coordinate here. We've got this um, star baker penguin, so we want to put a text box here that we're going to anchor on the coordinates somewhere around here. Um, and then we've got our uh, losing penguin who um, we're going to put a text box somewhere around here with a coordinate there um, to highlight the, the data for this penguin. So I'm going to first um, organize our penguin highlights um, data frame. Like penguin highlights should be some kind of new hairstyle trend than what everybody else would think about that. I think it would be a bit weird. Um, so we're going to arrange them by uh, bill length just for our own sanity so that we know um, which penguin goes where. Um, and then uh, yeah, can add the new take call in. So we're going to add in some coordinates for our um, boxes, which are here. So then we go go back to penguin highlights. Um, for each box, we're giving it an x and a y coordinate that corresponds to where we want to put the boxes. Um, and we're going to give it. Um, a means of aligning the text. This will become a little bit clearer uh, once we go to plot it. So this is basically saying that if the box is to the right of the point, then we want to align uh, the box to so that it touches. Uh, well, we want to kind of right align, the left align the box to its coordinate. And uh, if the box is going to be on the left, then we want to right align it to its coordinate. Um, and then we're going to add some arrow end coordinates in. So we're going to add some arrows for our boxes, which are going to go from the box coordinates to the point, and they're going to stop just short of the point. So if it's coming from above, it needs to stop just short above it. So if it's coming from left, it needs to stop um, just left of it. And that's all that the code is doing um, here. You can have another look at that um, in your own time if you want to. Um, but we've basically given it everything that we need. We've got some commentary, we've got some coordinates, we've got some alignments, and we've got where the arrows need to end and for each of our boxes. So um, let's go and make use of all of this and add it into our plot. So we go back to our leveled up plot, which is down here. And we're going to add another ggtext Xbox. So again, this time we want the data to be the penguin highlights rather than anything else that we've been working on up till now. In terms of the aesthetics, we've still got the same. Um, nope, we need to change them. So in terms of the aesthetics, we need to give it now the coordinate of the box rather than the coordinate of the point. So we're going to say x equals the labels x, which we created in our data frame, y equals the label Oops. y, and then our label for it is going to be commentary. So let's just run that 
and see what it does. Okay, so um, not particularly good um, in terms of how it looks just now, but we have added our text boxes in um, and we've done it in one call rather than in having a geom text box call for each label, which I think is probably a more efficient way of doing it, especially the more you've got, um, the better it is to do something along these lines. So we need to go in and format this to make sure that it actually helps us tell the story nicely. So we are going to um, change our font as we have done earlier. It's a bit neater already. Uh, we're going to make the text smaller. We are going to make the boxes transparent. And uh, at the moment, the boxes are kind of sitting on the middle of the coordinates that they were given. Um, so we want to, oh, I've been putting that in the wrong place. Uh, where are we? There we go. These ones. Apologies. There we go, that looks better. Um, so the boxes, as you can see, they're currently sitting right in the middle of the coordinates that we've given them. So what we need to do is align the box um, with the coordinates in terms of whether it's coming at it from the left or from the right. So um, we'll just do that by giving it this extra variable. And that has moved them. Okay, so do you remember those variables? Um, this was the one over here. Um, that does your left to right um, alignment. If you Google alignment cheat sheet, you'll get to a blog post that I wrote to help me remember um, which way is one and which way is zero. But it, it is kind of logical in the way that you think um, that zero is left and one is right. Yes, it's great. So we've got our plot um, sorted. So let's just get rid of the box contour. We don't really need that. Um, okay. I think that's looking pretty nice. Um, we've got our boxes, but again, if we were to just render that, I think we need to add some arrows in um, to make it a little bit clearer what it is that we are looking at. So we're going to use the arrow end coordinates and um, put those in as a geom curve element. So the curve, and again, the data that we're using is from the Penguin highlights. And in terms of the aesthetics, we're gonna keep the color relevant to the species, because you can see it's already colored everything the way that it needs to. That's why we fed all of that in at the very start up here, because we're keeping these aesthetics it's the same across all of the different bits of data that we're feeding it. So where were we? Let's find the curve. Here we go. So we want the arrow to start at the x label of the, the x coordinate of the box, and we want it to end at the arrow x end that we created using our mutate um, call earlier. Um, and then we want to do the same thing for the y coordinates. Let's just pop those in. Um, now, if we do this, there we go, we get some curves, um, which are probably a bit too, a bit more accentuated than we would like them to be. Um, so let's just go and change that. Uh, curvature, I'm going to go for the 0.15, some slightly straighter lines. Um, and then we also probably want to add a arrow onto the end of them. There we go, so we've got our arrows. Um, and same uh, as earlier, we were talking about the text hierarchy. I feel like those arrows kind of stand out a little bit more than they should do compared to uh, the data. So I'm just going to make them transparent. A little bit transparent. Um, and there we go. We have some nice little um, arrows that do the job nicely. Let's just export that and see where we are. Oops. Okay, so we've got our arrows. Um, and the last thing I want to do is align the text inside the boxes so that the alignment of the text kind of draws us directly to the point that we're looking at. So we're gonna go back to our text box here. And we had 
H just controls where the box sits, and H align controls where the text sits, sits inside the box. Um, so if we go along with that, there we go. Yeah, as, have you seen that? It just moved the dots right again. Have a look at our exporter plot. And ta -da! there we go. We've got our boxes with the text lined up nicely, and we can see um, quite obviously what it is that they are pointing at. Um, so <laughs> we've moved quite a bit. We've gone from something with no text boxes to something that now um, has a wee bit of story um, added into it. And so, oops, there we go. And um, so we can see the text boxes that are in. We're highlighting the star baker, the runner up, um, and the penguin that didn't do quite so well in this uh, Bake Off session. We're nearly there, folks. Um, the last thing we need to do is give everything a bit of space to breathe. Now, you might be thinking that you also uh, could do with a bit of space to breathe after this whistle-stop tour of um, all the ways in which we can improve our plots. Um, but I promise we are very nearly there. So and the first thing we're going to do, we're going to go back to our um, coding. And we are going to change the line height, default line height of our text. It's a simple thing, but um, it just makes it all a little bit less in your face um, and allows it to, to breathe nicer. And um, then we are going to change the grid. So the panel grid is just a wee bit too dark. I think it's getting in the way. Um, so you can change that to be absolutely anything uh, you like. <laughs> you need this elements line, um, and then color, and you can get it pink um, if you wanted to, um, just to highlight what it is that we're looking at. Um, but we're not going to make it pink. Um, instead, we're going to add um, a hex code of a very pale gray, um, which just makes it a bit less distracting than it had been. And up to that point. And then those of you who um, have been looking closely, you see that when we render this, um, oh, it's not too bad actually. So this little guy sometimes gets knocked off the, the side, uh, but they seem to be getting nicely. But we're just going to expand the um, X scale a little bit to give it more wiggle room left to right. And we're going to do this using scale x continuous and I quite like like using the multiple um, for expanding things just because if you reuse this theme uh, or this plot idea with a set of data that has a different order of magnitude it should keep you about right so again let's just give it a little bit more space to breathe there we go and when we export it and um, this is where we were and this is where we are now and it just looks a little bit uh, neater so there we go. We have given everything um, a bit of space to breathe. Um, I think you have now earned a well-deserved space to breathe as well. We've covered these, these uh, last three points um, of leveling up your plots. Um, and I think we've gone a long way. Um, if you remember where we were with our basic plots, let me just bring that up. Um, should still be saved. Yeah, gosh, so this is where we were with a perfectly, perfectly functional plot, um, but not particularly pleasing uh, and a bit overwhelming um, to this plot, which tells the story um, much more nicely. Um, so yeah. at this point, I think I'm gonna hand over to you again uh, to see if you can create some annotations for the plots that you're working on and create as many or as few as you like. Um, it could just be highlighting some data points or it could be explaining you know, this bar represents x um, just something that will help the, the reader understand and something that gives you a chance to play uh, with some arrows if you like to uh, but at least with some text boxes and play with the alignments there um, make use of the main colors if you can um, within the the aesthetics call um, but again see see how far you want to take this um, if you feel that at this point all you want to do is grab yourself a beer or another coffee that's also absolutely fine um, but if we come back in 15 minutes um, and just do a last wee bit of feedback and some Q&A and um, hopefully that will have given you a useful session in which you can take something home and, and work on your own plots. So before we break off, does anyone have any questions about all of this?
Uh, hello? Yes? Hi, I've, I've got a question. Um, I think I put it in the chat earlier, this the issue about um, using the GG save. So basically, mm -hmm. when I'm in the RStudio cloud, and yeah. following the, the scripts and then saving it there and, and viewing the exported plot, it, it looks fine. But as soon as I have the same code in R on my desktop, using exactly the same code, using exactly the same GG save export. Um, mm. that, so when I'm getting the small text, the resolution just it is, the text goes all small huh. when I export it. That's really odd. OK. Um, and you've set your, you've set the resolution um, the same across the two. Yeah, so it's using exactly the same code. So as okay. I mentioned earlier, I'm still quite new to R, um, but this yeah, is yeah. an issue I've been encountering since I started, basically, and yeah. I don't quite understand what's going on. So I, um, yeah, I was just having a look at what maybe what the default unit of these guys is, um, because there might be some kind of hidden um, variable going on there. Yeah, so the, the units have options of being inches, centimeters, millimeters, or pixels. It might be worth having a look um, yeah. if you try and set that the same across the two devices. Um, and the other thing to check is in your options, um, your graphics device, whether you've set that to AGG as well. Um, okay. I'll try a few. Okay. <laughs> see how see how you get on with that. Uh, but if not, maybe just make your text bigger <laughs> for the purpose of getting the the plot sorted. Um, although I appreciate that's not really the answer that's going to be useful for you in the long term. But yeah, explore those options, and uh, and we'll come back and see how you've gone. Thank you. Great. Okay. Any other questions, or should we just have a wee break and have a look at this exercise? I think it looks like there's no more questions. Yep. No. All quiet's in the chat. So. Great. Well, I'll set the timer going, um, and then if anyone wants to share a plot um, at the end of this, that would be that would be wonderful. Uh, but no pressure to do so. So 15 minutes, try and play around with some annotations and then we'll end with a few sources of inspiration and any other questions that you have. See you in a bit. There's really not very much left to do um, because I noticed that we're, we're down by a few numbers, but hopefully those of you who are still here are here because you found it useful um, up to this point, um, which is good to know. Um, so here we have uh, where we left off with the exercise. And these are the seven tips that we have applied to our plots. We've used color purposefully. We've used intuitive orientations. We've added some color to our text and um, to help orient our readers. Uh, we've used colors and fonts to add some hierarchy. We've reduced unnecessary eye movements, highlighted important data points, and given everything, um, including ourselves, a little bit of space in which to breathe. And in doing so, we've gone from this plot here, which was perfectly functional, um, and if you had made this in ggplot and you knew to R, then actually this is not a bad job at all, um, to something like this, which is much more compelling um, as a storytelling device. Uh, but the key really, um, I guess the proof is in the pudding, um, if we go back to the Bake Off analogy, um, and let's just see if this actually worked. So what um, do you remember which um, type of banana produced the least tasty cakes? Um, I think we're all happy that we remember that it was the green bananas that were not very good. Um, and then what about, what about a star baker? Which type of banana uh, did they use? Do you remember? Um, I think it was brown bananas, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. Yeah, brown bananas up here. And then the runner up used yellow bananas. And um, we just looked at that. Um, and in terms of baking duration, do we remember that as well? I think the brown bananas tended to be towards the left of the plot so they had to bake for less time um and our penguin that left the tent the wrong type of banana and didn't leave the cake in the oven for long enough so all these things um just to to show you that yes it was a totally ridiculous story but we did manage to tell it in a way um that made it memorable um from from the plot so hopefully you'll be able to harness some of that, uh, maybe not talking about penguins baking, but harness some of that and make use of it in your own plots to make the story really shine um, and resonate with people who are, who are reading about it. 
Uh, we've made it to, to the end of the official content with enough time um, for a bit of a bonus track. So I thought I would share with you um, just some sources of, of inspiration uh, for data viz and places that you can go um, to get inspiration, but also to try and um, skill up um, if that's what you want to do. Um, for me, the biggest change um, in my data viz skills has come from taking part in the Tidy Tuesday challenge on Twitter. Um, it's absolutely brilliant. Um, what it is, is that every Tuesday, there's a new data set that's released and it's always, it's off most of the time. Um, it is something completely innocuous. So it doesn't matter, you, you know, there's no politics to get your foot in. There's nothing, uh, it doesn't matter if you get the data wrong, they're just going to be changing all their lives based on what you're finding there. Um, but it allows you to create plots and to practice in a safe space. Um, the feedback that you get from that community is absolutely brilliant. Um, if you get stuck on stuff, people are happy to jump in um, and give you a hand. And the beauty of it is that people share their code as well. So the first time I saw people doing this, I thought, goodness, how on earth do you do that with ggplot? Turns out you can find exactly, exactly how, by just how by following the link. Um, so I just clicked on um, the link that I had there just to show you some of the stuff that people are doing. Um, yeah. It's pretty wild. Um, and you can go, and most of the time the code is linked. See, there you go, there's a link to the code. Um, and it just shows you uh, what they've done. Now, you probably wouldn't want to use um, these types of plots necessarily in your publications. I think this one's really nice, actually. Can I give it a wee like? Um, so that's a really nice plot, nice color scheme, um, nice change of the background, nice fonts. Um, and what this, what this has taught me is how to change pretty much every aspect of a plot uh, that you could want to manipulate. So yeah, you might not want to be using kind of horror movie fonts in your uh, visualizations, but this shows you how to change the font, how to use a font that's maybe not a standard one, um, how to presumably bring in images is what they've done here um, from online. Um, yeah, so it's great. Not only do you get inspiration for the plot itself, but you also get to see how they did it. Um, and look at the code behind it. So I really encourage you to, to check that out um, and to take part as well. Um, you know, the more the merrier. Um, it's really good fun. And as I said, it's a really friendly environment. There are a whole load of data, data viz and design books that you can get your hands on. I find following some of these Tidy Twitter people, uh, Tidy Tuesday people means that you get recommendations on books that are good. A couple of them sitting on my shelf uh, behind me there. What have we got? We've got data sketches. We've got uh, better data visualizations. Um, there's also a book about understanding comics uh, that I really enjoyed looking at, just thinking about how we process um, visual information. So find the people that you think are producing good content and go and read what they're reading. Uh, that would be my top tip there. In terms of colour palettes, I have two young children and I find kids' books absolutely brilliant um, if you're looking for vibrant colour palettes. So um, even if you don't have kids, you can take yourself along to your local library and have a wee browse through the section there with your phone handy. So you take a wee photo um, of really vibrant pictures that you like and see if you can pick some uh, some, some colours out of that. Um, in terms of skill in um, data and uh, data-driven storytelling, I would say find yourself some data journalists that you think are doing a really good job. Um, I really like the, the way that uh, John Byrne Murdoch tweets and he often shares a lot of good plots uh, alongside it. He's quite good at sharing concise um, information and he also retweets a lot of visualisations that he thinks good. Um, so again, surround yourself um, with these kind of people um, online and see um, if you can get inspiration from what they're doing there. Um, and artists, you know, I, I said earlier towards the start, I find picking colours actually quite difficult. Um, so what I tend to do is pop along to the local art gallery every now and then or follow some good Twitter accounts. I've really been enjoying some of the stuff that's been shared on the women's art Twitter feed recently. Um, Again, not everything's going to be a cup of tea, but there'll be some really stunning color combinations that come out um, or, you know, simple ones or really, really bold ones. Um, again, it's just quite fun getting really, really vibrant colors and seeing how, how people whose, whose whole skill it is um, to combine colors well, uh, do it and see if you can learn, uh, learn from that. But there we go, that's, that's it as far as the content that I'm providing um, is concerned. Do you, does anyone have um, any further questions or is there any feedback that you would like to get on your plots or you know another plot that you've seen that you want us to discuss um, that's absolutely fine as well Josie shall I hand over to you um, to field a q and a if there is one yep I'm not seeing anything in the chat at the moment it's um all quiet yeah 
That's okay. That's fine. If there are no questions, this is Friday afternoon. I think it's acceptable <laughs> for us to oh, head up. There is a wee. I think we get some thank yous. So that's just. Oh, um, that's always nice. <laughs> Info. Thank you. Lots to be going on with. Yeah, no, you're welcome. There, There is a lot of information. I think, yeah, for me, it was really getting involved in the Tidy Tuesday stuff that taught me how to do um, a lot of this manipulation. Um, that I found to be to be really good in developing skills for, for data visualization. So I really do encourage you to get involved in, in that kind of stuff if this is a skill that you that you want to develop. And you don't have to create the most wacky plots. You can do no, perfectly normal plots um, and, and get some feedback on those as well or see what else you might want to manipulate. But, um, yeah, that was a really good session. Thank you. Sounds oh, like a fantastic session as well. Um, I have popped a um, link to the feedback sheet in there if you guys can fit it in. The community would really enjoy, appreciate that. Um, but you'll get a link in the email as well that will come out after the session. Great. So thank you very much, Cara, for taking us through leveling up our plots. I found that really interesting. It was really good. Um, I didn't code long today, but I will be revisiting a lot of that. <laughs> there's a lot of use for that in what I've um, got. Uh, yeah. Sam's asked, did you send a link for the slides? Um, I didn't. I will upload those and um, send you. Should I send you a link, Josie, and then you can send it around? Or yeah, I can, or I can pass it on to Charlotte <laughs> to send it around. Yeah, I'll send it around. I'll send it to Charlotte and she can uh, she can keep us right. But yes, I will I will send send a link uh, for these slides for people who want to read more about it. Yeah, no, that was really good. Thank you very much. Great. Well, thank you very much. Um, have a lovely evening, everyone. And I uh, hope to see at least some of you at the in-person conference. Um, oh, yes. Over a week's time. Yeah, just over a week. We'll see you there. Yeah. I'll, be, I'll be up at the in-person conference. Great. Perfect. Well, we'll see you then. Thank you. How are you done?